Well, today uh, we are continuing uh, to take a look at the mission of Redemption Church. Uh, just as a reminder, I was asked again this last week uh, why we have astronauts in space uh, for our church. I was like, well, why not, right? Uh, we're on a mission. And just like those who do space projects, they have mission control. We have a mission control. And our Heavenly Father has a plan. And we want to follow that. And we believe that by starting with loving one another, as we talked about a few weeks ago, and last week we talked about discipleship, we talked about discipling one another, and then thirdly, by equipping one another. That We believe that at Redemption, that the mission to love, disciple, and equip kind of summarizes what we want to do as a church. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to take a look at verses 11 and 12. Ephesians 4, chapter, sorry, verse 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers, verse 12, to equip his people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up. God lays out a, a plan here to equip the church. And I pray and hope that we as a church are doing this. So we're going to take a look at this. Now it's interesting, the word equip right here is a Greek word that's used only one time in the New Testament. This is the one and only time. It's interesting because it, it means to prepare and bring into a condition of completeness but it comes from a root word that means to fit together. And I think that that's important for us to understand because I believe what Paul lays out here and in some other of his letters and passages is that when we talk about equipping one another, what we're talking about is, is fitting together what God has already given us. We want to bring everyone together in a way that you would put together pieces of a puzzle. In verse 12, we read that we are to be equipping because I think that it does two things. First of all, it completes the works of service. And secondly, because it builds up the body of Christ. And so when we talk about equipping, those are the two areas that we want to be focused on. We want to complete works of service, which God has for us, and we want to build up the body of Christ. So let's talk about works of service. It's part of the reason that we were created. In Paul's letter to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we read, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God wants us to do things. God wants us to be people of action. People of of faith and people of action. Because we find ourselves in a time where we find that we, and I just having a conversation this week, that we as Christians, we, we tend to be reservoirs and not conduits. We just accumulate masses of information and just kind of hang on to it. But it's just one more thing. It, it's just more information. But God doesn't want that. He wants us to be acting. He wants us to be doing. He wants us to be people of action. And when we look at all the way back from Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, and even in the end of time with Revelation, we see that God is calling people to do, to act. One of the things that he did with Adam and Eve, he said, I'm going to place you in this garden. And he gives, them, he gives them jobs. I want you to do stuff. You've got, to, you've got to be a partner in this, he says. I want you to have some skin in the game, so to speak. And then we see throughout the Old Testament, I want you to go. I want you to do. And I've always 
pondered on the fact that when he calls Abraham, he says, get up from the land that you live in and go to a place that I want to show you. But he has works for us. He has actions that he wants us to take. Because in the process of doing those works, we develop relationship with him and dependence on him and we grow in him. So I believe that when God says, uh, lays out here that we are to be equipping each other and equipping the saints, we're doing this because that's the reason that we're created. He created us to be people of action. The second thing is that the service is an expression of our Christ-likeness. Being a servant, doing things of service, is an expression of us being like Christ. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus says, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life for many. We can never be Jesus. But I hear this a lot. It's like, how can I be more Christ-like? How can I be more like Jesus? And Jesus lays out some pretty simple guidelines on that, right? Love people, serve people. Love them as I have loved you, serve them as I have served you. But we... We live in a world where service is all about what people are serving us, right? Predominantly. Just this week I was listening to an audio book about a growing economy and, and what factions of the economy is growing the fastest. And the largest group of employees in America right now, it surpassed manufacturing years ago, but it just continues to grow, is the service area. So that's everything from your waitresses and, and waiters to people who work at gas stations to the person who services your appliances. The largest part of our economy is serving one another. You would think if that... So thinking biblically, right? When I, when, I, when I heard that, I was thinking about this passage that I was going to be speaking about this week. And I thought, you know, it's interesting... So here we are that many people say that we're a Christian nation, which that's up for debate, and it's definitely been declining in the last 50 years. And the largest growing population of people inside the United States are in service positions. So following a biblical perspective, then we should be becoming more Christ-like, right? More and more Americans are serving one another. It doesn't seem to be happening that way, though, does it? Why do, you, why do you think that is? Is it because maybe we look at service as something that's degrading or demeaning? Instead of valuing our fellow citizens, our fellow humans for doing stuff that enhances us, that enriches our lives? We, we look down upon things, and we, we criticize, we are short-tempered with them. But yet Jesus calls us, he said, you want to be Christ-like? You want to be equipped? I'm equipping you to be servants. There's not... I've, I've kind of said these phrases before, but you know, it just sticks with me is that we, there's a lot of Christians that love, they want a bumper sticker theology kind of approach to life, right? God is my co-pilot, whatever, you know, let's coexist, all these good things. This is not a good bumper sticker that people don't want to buy. It's like, I want to be a servant. I want to be less. We, we want to be the top, and we, right? The old Frank Sinatra, right? I'm king of the hill. I did it my way. I, I'm the best and the top. And everybody wants to be there. But 
Jesus is saying, look, you want to, I'm equipping you because I have works of service for you. We have to think about mentality changes in our own heart, in our own mind. How do we perceive the idea of us being a servant? How do we perceive serving other people? And sometimes it's not, obviously it's not glamorous, right? It, it's not the thing that gets the most attention. It's not what's under the spotlights. But it's the things that need to be done. And God is like, in my kingdom, you need to be servants. I have works of service for you. Our service should point to God. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus tells his disciples, you should do good works, let your light shine so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Notice who receives the glory. Notice who the focus should be on. Even when people do notice that you're being a servant, and even when they acknowledge it, and they may applaud you, or they may show appreciation, that applause and appreciation and any glory that you may receive should be then passed along to the Father in heaven. So we're talking about being a church that is equipping Let's just be, I'm, I'm setting up the premise of why we're equipping people. We're equipping each other so that we can serve each other and serve our community and serve our world because Jesus demonstrated that and he commands it and he wants us to do it. Again, not so that they're like, wow, those people at Redemption are awesome and great. <clears throat> Applauds to them. No, so that people see things and like, there's something behind that. That drives me to ask the question, why are they that way? Which creates opportunities for us then to share. Well, let me tell you why. Now that you've asked, let me tell you about the God that gives me hope, that gives me peace, that gives me a future, and let me share them with you. Why I'm a servant to you is because I serve a king who is a servant to me. He gave us this command and this premise of idea of equipping so that we could have works of service. Secondly, is to build up the body of Christ. God is the one who builds the body, not us. I just want that out front, right? I'm going to reference here Psalm 139 when David writes that you knit me together in my mother's womb. And I want that image in our mind that, that we, we take these things and we see woven into Scripture in the Old and New Testament, God takes the physical to explain the spiritual. He takes that which is seen so that we can understand what is unseen. And so I, in this moment, let me just say, if you can believe, and we hopefully all of us do, that God is the one who puts us together inside our mother womb. He is the one who took the DNA strands and laid them out in a particular order, so that when they came together and formed us, the person that came out and is born is you. God made you. He made you as tall as you are, or short as you are, whatever color hair you have, unless Clairol has something to do with it. He knows how many days you'll have. He wove together your parents' DNA so that your personality was a certain way. And that goofy thing that your, your grandpa did that you're like, oh, now that you're older, you do it too, right? I catch, I, okay, this is, I know it's cliche, 
but it, I find myself, I just reminded myself this week, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm a walking cliche. My family, they do not know how to turn lights off. I'm going to say, I'm going to assume this, and I apologize, I'm going to gender assume. Men, do you, do you say amen? Because typically, if, like for me, it was my father was always the one. In most other houses I've ever been around, it's usually the guy. That's just going around. And I caught myself this last week. Turning lights off. Especially if it's daylight. Why are the outside lights on? (laughs) But I realize that somewhere in the genetic strand of who I am, God knit something in there that is bugged that the light's on. Now, that seems very silly. I know. He also knit together that I could read Scripture and understand it. He he put in me a, a thing of understanding, and I thank him for that. He He put together a fact that I'm able to enjoy the beauty of this world and appreciate it. That he, he put it in all of our brains that we see a sunrise or sunset and it triggers something in us. Or we see a mountain range and it does something to us. Or a beach or, or a lake or whatever it is that you, you look at. We all have different things. But there's something about this world that when we look at the stars or we look at something here in this world and it just... It moves us. He, he put that in you. The same thing goes for the body of Christ. God is the one who knits us together and puts us together. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, he says he, that he chose us. God chose us before the creation of the world to be brought into Christ. So just as he would take strands of DNA and manipulate it so that of all the possibilities, when your mom gave birth to you, you came out with all of your little quirkinesses and all of your awesomeness. In the same way, I believe what the Bible is telling us is that God took each and every one of us as little pieces of the DNA of who God's body is here on earth, the body of Christ, and he put us together. Of all the times that you could have lived, and of all the places that you could have lived, and of all the people that you could know, you're here today. And this last Friday night, we had an ice cream social here. Which, by the way, kids, we're going to have lots of ice cream tonight because there's a lot left over. The the fun that was had and and we got together and we 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 call it a family fellowship because that's what we are i was just speaking with somebody before church and they were reminding me of the this principle that some of us are closer to each other here in this room than we are to our own flesh and blood brothers and sisters or moms or dads or uncles and aunts and we're family because why because god took us like little strands of dna and they knit us together to become the body of christ which sometimes begs to ask, why? Why me? Why us? Why now? And what do you want us to do if God is the one that put us together? 1 Peter 2 says, As you come to Christ, the living stone, rejected by human hands, chosen by God and precious to Him, you are living stones being built into a spiritual house. He wants to build us and put us together. He is the architect. He is the builder. He is the one who puts us in place. And he does so by bringing many parts to form one body. Paul talks about this in a couple of different places. Two places I will highlight. 1 Corinthians 12.12 12. 
For just as the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though are many, are one body, so it is with Christ. In Romans 12, 5, he echoes this by saying, So we, though we are many, are one body in Christ, individual members, one to another. We are many who become one. And God puts things together, you're like, that doesn't seem like that that would go together. Right? Just think about the very fundamental building block of our whole society, marriage, right? One of the sayings goes within marriage, opposites what? Attract. God has, in his infinite wisdom, and I think irony, put men and women who by nature are different, and then uniquely wove together individuals who are different, and then says, watch this, put them together. And in natural form, they don't go. In fact, you know, like back to, I'm going way back for some of us to our high school, maybe middle school science here. You remember when you took magnets and you figured out that they have like a north and a south and then the opposites attract, but what happens when you put the same together and they repel? That some of us are in marriage that we get to, it's like you, you would think on paper that you should just repel each other. But for some reason, they just, it works. Because you have God in the middle of it. And God's like, watch this. I'm going to take two things that don't look like they go together and make them go together. And then multiply that by 10, by 100, by 1,000, by a billion. And I'm going to take the people who don't look like they should go together from different times and periods and cultures and languages and backgrounds. And I'm going to weave them together to be the body of Christ. And the body is better for it. If we were all eyeball molecules, that would be a sorry human being. If we were all feet, gross, right? If we were all elbow or ear, that that would be horrible. God's like, watch this. I'm going to put all these pieces together and out of these many pieces, I will make one body. So he's equipping us by bringing us together. It's the reason for that Greek. I think that's why Paul uses, inspired by the Holy Spirit, this word that says, I'm putting things together. I'm equipping you. I'm fitting things together so that we may grow into the head of the body, which is Christ. Ephesians 4, 15-16. Speak the truth in love. Grow to become in every respect a mature body, which will grow into him the head that is Christ. For from him the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. We all grow to be towards him. He is the brain. He's the central nervous system. He is the thing that controls us, or at least it should. Now, in your body, I'm not a doctor, but in your body, when you have cells that don't operate as the way they're supposed to operate, they're unhealthy, right? That's where we get things like tumors and cancer. Those are cells in our body, produced by our body, that shouldn't be there. They don't act the way that they're supposed to. The same can happen, I believe, in the body of Christ. And sometimes, Jesus sometimes has to do some, some chemo on us. That's part of the equipping. That's the part of the purging. It's part of preparing the body of Christ to do the acts of service which he has for us. Now, y'all are going to go home this afternoon and be wondering, like, am I part of the cancer, right? I 
I'll let you pray about that one. I asked the same question. Because I don't want to be. And sometimes God's got to do some spiritual chemo on me to get me back in alignment. So, that's why we're equipped. That's why I believe that we should be equipping. is so that we bring people into alignment with one another because the body of Christ is to be one body so that we can accomplish the acts of service that he has for us. The question is, how do we do that? Which is an excellent question. Paul writes very briefly right here. He gives us some ideas about this. Verse 11. He says, Christ gave what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So that we can then equip the people. This idea of apostles, prophets, teachers, we've given some sanctimonious, sanctified, conceptualized meanings to these words, and we, we sometimes maybe elevate them to above what they really should be. What we could say is this, God gives messengers and envoys, that's what an apostle is. He, he gives people to bring the message. They're an ambassador for Christ. Apostles have purpose and, and definitely stature of within the church. But let's remember what they are. They are only representatives of the one who sent them. So they shouldn't be elevated too high because they're one of us. They're the apostle. They're the one who brings the messenger. Then you have prophets. Now here's the one that in our modern translation and understanding of the word prophet, we have heavily misinterpreted this. So the word prophet originally means one who speaks and interprets God's word. One who speaks and interprets God's word. We have gotten to the point, though, that we think of a prophet as somebody who's going to give us the crystal ball, magic voodoo, into the future. When in all honesty, the word means that you basically are understanding God's word and you're passing it along. In many ways, that's what I do on a Sunday. Is I pass along to you what God's word says. Helping to interpret and understand it so that we can apply it in our life. Then you have the evangelist. The evangelist is a vocational calling to preach the gospel. And some are called to that. Some people have that giftedness. Some people just, they could take any conversation, every situation, and before you know it, they're talking about Christ and somebody's on their knees praying and accepting Jesus. There are just some people who are called and gifted in this. Then you have the pastor. The original word here is shepherd. A shepherd leads and provides and protects the flock. So here at Redemption, we use this word pastor, and we think about a shepherd. You should think beyond just me. Yes, I often use the title, and many people reference to me as Pastor Jason, as though I'm the pastor. But we have a group of elders Men who are shepherds along with me. Who are here to provide and protect and guide the flock. And then you have teachers. Those who instruct and inspire others. Now, historically, in the last probably few hundred years definitely in the last hundred years here in the United States, we have crammed all of these things into one person. And that one person is usually the person standing up here behind a pulpit giving a message. As though this person can, and possibly some do, contain all of those gifts and talents and abilities. 
But they are not the only sole reservoir of them. And should not be. So what do we just talk about the body of Christ? Many parts, one body. Meaning that within the body of Christ, not just here in redemption, but across the city, across the state and the world, but let's just start here in this room. Inside this room, there are those of you who serve as teachers. Some of you who serve as shepherds. Some who may be evangelists. Who bring other people into the church. Who bring people to Christ. Who share the message with them. Many of you I know are ambassadors. You are apostles for Christ. You are ambassadors in your workplace, at your school, in your life, with your neighbors. This idea that we are to be equipped... For service means that all of us have these things in us, given to us by God. The word equip, a reminder again, is that, that brings it together. It fits things that God already did. I'm not teaching you to be an apostle. I'm not here to teach you to be a prophet or a shepherd. God gave you those things. When he knit you together, physically and spiritually, he gave you those things. Why we come together is to see you mature and develop those things so that God's body can function. And I say this in part because Peter teaches this in 1 Peter 2.9. That each one of us is called to be a part of this special calling it says, you are royal priests. This is 1 Peter 2.9. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You can replace the word you with your name. There's certain passages of Scripture I encourage you to do that with because it makes it very personal and it makes it very clear what God is trying to convey to us through His writings. It may sound something like this. Jason, you're a royal priest. You, you are a holy nation. You're part of a holy nation. You are God's possession. As a result, Jason, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness and into his light. You want to know the, the thing about it is, is that you guys, I'm saying this, all honesty, you have access, because I've been asked this question before. Is it just because I have a special call in my life to be a vocational pastor? Well, I spent most of my life not being a vocational pastor, but I still did most of these things. I taught. I was an evangelist. I tried to share the gospel with people. I tried to lead people. I tried to protect and provide for people. I did all the services until I actually took the vocation of this. So it's not that I, as I now receive a check to be called pastor of this church, became something that you can't be. You all have the right and the calling to do what I do. Every one of us are called to be part of the body of Christ. To do our part. The goal and purpose of us coming together as a church, as redemption is to help you find out what that is and how that it fits with the others who are called to be here. In our marriage, my wife and I, we have a lot of similar things, but we have a lot of different things. And I'm talking about spiritual giftedness. My wife 
and she's not here today, so I'm not saying this because she's, you know, I'm not like trying to give brownie points. She is way more loving than I am. She is way more insightful about other people and, empath- and, and having empathy with others. God has gifted her in special ways like that. There are things when I watch her lead women's ministry and lead ministry in general that I'm like, I just don't have, I don't have the, it's not part of my DNA. Because she'll do things and I'm like, that was really smart. And she's like, well, it's obvious. Not obvious to me. So I, I just, maybe in your own marriage or in your own relationships with people around you that you've experienced this, where you see where there are areas that other people just enrich you because of their presence in your life. And hopefully, prayerfully, there's at least one thing maybe that in my life that I enhance hers. In the same way that we come together as a body of Christ, maybe we don't see it in ourselves, but maybe someone else does. And that's why he calls us to be together. To equip, meaning to fit. To piece it together for the greater good of his body. To accomplish the gifts, sorry, to accomplish the acts of service that he has gifted us to do. We love one another, we disciple one another, and we are to equip one another. That's the heart, that's the the mission of redemption. Now I was asked this, this week, I was asked a very good question. And the question was this, so how do you do it? How do I, Jason, personally, and how do we as redemption disciple people and how do we equip people? And that's an excellent question. that I'm hoping that you could help me figure out. And I say that because, yeah, I have, obviously, I have some ideas. Obviously, as pastor, as a leader, uh, as someone who's been challenged and, and commissioned to lead, and, and to, we have ideas and programs and things in place, and we want to grow those things, yes. But here's the beauty. Back to what I just said earlier, and I've been talking about for the last 30 minutes. We are the body of Christ. So God may have played things in your heart and your mind that I don't see and I don't know and vice versa. And then we come together to find out what's the best way that we can disciple one another? What's the best way that we can equip one another? So that we are growing together as the body of Christ into the head of him who is over all of us. So that we can accomplish the acts of service that he has laid out for us. If we do that, I mean, it's, I mean, this would be that would be an awesome church, wouldn't it? That would be, to use the physiological kind of mindset, that would be a healthy body when all parts are functioning together to accomplish a goal, to move the body forward. That's where we want to get to. In the upcoming months, we're going to be meeting together a few times with some leadership, vision casting. Part of that idea is how do we do that? How do we carry this out? How do we disciple? How do we equip so that we can accomplish things God wants to accomplish? Well, I want to, I want to pray right now about that. But we're not done, so don't leave. Because we're going to have communion in just a moment. Because one of the beauties of Christ's body coming together is he's like, he gives us these little moments and communion is one of them where we get to be together as one. So let me pray real quick and then we'll have communion together. Heavenly Father, I just am amazed at the complexity of arranging for people to be born at a certain place and certain time to have the activities of their life flow through time and bring us all together so that we could be at the right place at the right time as you ordained it to be. 
so that you can knit us together to be your body. So I pray, Heavenly Father, first of all, that we do not neglect to appreciate every and each part that you bring in together. It is our human tendency to sometimes elevate certain people, places, and things to the detriment of others. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would recognize that we are all equal at the foot of cross. That we are all equally important in the body of Christ. And secondly, Heavenly Father, I pray for those in the room who maybe don't feel like they don't have a place. I, I ask, God, that you would please just reveal to them the place you have for them. That they may fulfill the purpose that you specifically have made them to do. So that the body as a whole is better for it. Heavenly Father, we're reminded that there are sometimes where we may be elevated and appreciated, and other times our acts of service seem to go unnoticed, but we know that your eyes that sees all and knows all never misses it. So Heavenly Father, help us to remember that we don't do things for each other in the sense of gratitude and appreciation but instead god we do it all to the work and glory of you as long as we have that in mind we know that you will appreciate us you will bless us you will grow us and your body will be better for it and we ask it in your name god amen as i mentioned um we're going to take communion we, always, we, we try to do this on the last Sunday of every month, and we don't we could do it every time. We could do it every day. And there's a lot of discussion about how often we should do it, but the important thing is that I believe that we do it with the right attitude, whatever time and how often we do it. In Ephesians, uh, Paul writes that we are one body and one spirit, baptized into one God, Father and above all, who's in all. I sometimes talk about that passage when I do baptism services, but I, as I sit here today and we do communion, I think of the same thing, is that uh, this simple act. Um, of sitting together. Of taking the body and taking the blood in remembrance of Him. This simple act connects us The, the woven truth of history that is symbolized in this simple act goes back thousands of years to the very night that Christ was betrayed and He sat down with His disciples and He redefined a Passover meal which had been going on for thousands of years before that. One of the things that all of us as human beings desire is to be seen and to belong. When we sang earlier, we read in Zephaniah 3.17, God is looking over us. He's singing over us. We're seen. And by this simple act of communion, we recognize that we belong. We belong to each other, those who are in this room. We belong to a body of Christ represented by churches across this county and community and state and country and around this world. We belong to a church that goes back thousands of years to a faith that goes back even further to Abraham himself. So don't think of this as just there's a little cracker and some juice and a little plastic goblet. This, this simple act, this simple thing that you hold in your hand is a cosmic time machine that takes us 
back to the past and travels us forward to the future to the day that He returns. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. When God said, I am that I am, He's saying that I was and I am and I always will be. He is outside of time. And so when we join with Him in this act of communion, we join with our brothers and sisters who went before us, we join with those who come after us, we join with the Holy Father and Son and Holy Spirit Himself one day together in heaven. And we do that all right now. Because we are one body made of many. Let's prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would just look into us and cleanse us, prepare us to receive this this most sacred of sacraments that ties us to you, the very head of the body, in ways probably far deeper and more sincere than we could even conceive of. So I pray, Heavenly Father, today that we do not do this lightly. We recognize the significance of it. For it took the Son of God dying on a cross to allow us to do it. It's in your name I pray, God. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body. Let's take a remembrance of his sacrifice. Likewise, he took the cup and he blessed it. He said, this is my blood that is poured out for you. Let's take a remembrance of that. Heavenly Father, I pray a blessing on those who took communion today. I pray that you would just fill them, guide them, make crooked ways straight before them this week. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just enlighten each and every one of us as the living stones of this holy temple that you're building, which is the body of Christ. I pray. You as the great builder, use us as you see fit. And may whatever goodness or glory that we receive, may it be reflected solely back to you. So that men around us will glorify your name and be drawn to you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.